Good morning, good evening, whatever time of the day it is, wherever in the world you are listening to this. Welcome to the Hot Topics podcast from MB Medical. My name is Neil Tucker. It is Friday the 13th of December and it is unlucky for some, essentially anyone who didn't vote Conservative yesterday. So Boris's big gamble has paid off. He's got a large majority in the government and this is our future for better or for worse for the next four years. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time dwelling on politics. We don't want to listen to more politics. So instead, I thought I'd lighten the mood because it is almost Christmas. This is the last podcast we're going to do before Christmas. I had an early Christmas dinner with some local friends of mine here. They're a Spanish couple and a a Greek and Italian couple. All of our kids play together. And we had some Christmas crackers. Now, um, what's the best thing about Christmas crackers? No, it's not the plastic crap in it. No, it is the jokes. So I read this one out to everyone. Why did the chewing gum cross the road? Because it was stuck to the chicken. Now that got a laugh out of me and my wife, I have to say. I don't know what that don't know what that implies about us. My European friends, profound bemusement. If these humorless European mainlanders can't even get such a cracking Christmas cracker joke, then we don't need them anyway. So In this podcast, we are going to have a look at a couple of papers from the BMJ in the last week. We're going to have a look at a couple of papers in the latest BJGP as well, which are very interesting. And then we're going to have a slightly more in-depth look at a Lancet paper that went slightly under the radar, looking at the role of cholesterol levels in younger people significantly influencing their future cardiac risk. So what's been in the news over the last week or so? Well, no major revelations, but there are a few interesting points. I see in the BMJ there's an article on the UK's pledge to leave no person behind in providing universal health care. This is something that I presume is a given in the UK as opposed to a contrasting country like the US. But in fact, we haven't managed to achieve this either just yet. So particularly vulnerable groups like migrant groups, the children of of immigrants often have poor access to healthcare, and this is something that we need to try and improve on. They also report that the GMC has elected to not renew its contract for private health screening. This was an odd dichotomy, the fact that they were encouraging their staff to go and have an, a non-evidence-based intervention, which all the data suggests doesn't make any difference in outcomes overall. Uh, and further creates a disconnect between people working in the GMC and medics on the ground. So I think this is very welcome that not only are they saving some money for themselves, uh, we were all funding that, they're also stopping this disconnect between their staff and the real world. And then it's hard not to mention the insanity that seems to be going on in some parts of the USA. You might have seen a couple of weeks ago this report about Ohio, passing a law where medics are being forced to to attempt re-implantation of ectopic pregnancies that have been removed, despite the fact that this can't possibly work. Then I saw yesterday that in Kentucky, they've passed a law where women who are having an abortion are forced to look at an ultrasound scan that their doctors are being forced to do on them to show them the developing embryo or fetus before they have the abortion. How anyone can think that this is a fair, right or just thing to do is absolutely mind-boggling. And just goes to highlight, regardless of your political influences here in the UK, just how starkly different we can be from some parts of the Western world. Now, on to the research. And there was an interesting paper in the BMJ looking at the best strategy for uninvestigated dyspepsia. So that's essentially everything that we manage in primary care. People have not had any investigations as yet. And we already, of course, have national guidance on this. NICE would suggest that we can either test and treat or we can use empirical proton pump inhibitor therapy as equal first line options. The reality is probably most of us would go for the latter just for its simplicity, although there is some data that suggests the former leads to slightly better outcomes overall. So what does this new paper add to what we already know? Well, this is a network meta-analysis, so that's the statistical technique whereby you can compare different treatments that don't necessarily have head-to-head trials looking at them, as long as they've got some unified baseline comparator. 
this all results in some very funky looking tables in the paper. So one of them looks like the Atomium outside of Brussels, if you've ever been there. And then we've got a forest plot for good measure. It's all enthralling reading. So they looked at a variety of options, including the usual um, that we use already, but also uh, another option of prompt endoscopy and then test and scope rather than just test and treat. And the conclusion, well, they all seem to be as good as each other. So this was not a cost effectiveness comparison. Um, in the discussion, they passed the comment that going straight to endoscopy is obviously going to be much more expensive than empirical trials of treatment. Um, but what it also showed, and what I think is just a fascinating insight into human nature, is that um, we are absolute masochists because patients, um, whilst they might be aware that there's no differences in the benefits of each of these different strategies, they much prefer to have a scope shoved down their neck early on in the hope that they would get a more definitive diagnosis. The next paper in the BMJ was one looking at the use of antibiotic prescriptions in um, ambulatory care clinics. So this is primary care data that's come out of the USA. And I don't want to talk a lot about antibiotics today because we've talked about it on the course quite a lot before. There's been a lot in the journals and the press over the last few years. I think we're in danger of getting antibiotic stewardship fatigue and the last thing I want to do is put everyone off but um, but there was one really interesting point that that, that I saw that came out of this um, that I think we can give ourselves a pat on the back for so out of the 990 million ambulatory care visits during 2015 13 percent were prescribed antibiotics uh, according to the criteria the study used 57 percent were appropriate 25% were inappropriate and 18% had no documented indication. And they were really interested in that last group and why there may be no documented indication. And one of the risks for that I found was if the patient has seen a non-primary care specialist. So obviously this is much more common in, in the US than it is over here. But I think it's fascinating to see if you go and see a specialist, they are much more likely to give you an antibiotic. They may not have a, a strong justification for that. We as GPs are potentially a much more accurate arbitrator of antibiotic use. On to the BJGP and a couple of interesting papers here. The first was looking at the sensitivity of chest x-rays for de detecting lung cancer in people with symptoms. This was a systematic review of available studies. So it probably represents the highest level of evidence we've got in this area. And the conclusions are not really new conclusions, but they certainly do add weight to the fact that chest x-rays are not that great at excluding disease. So they found even in people with symptomatic lung cancer, the sensitivity of a chest x-ray was no better than 80%. So the clear message is that we as GPs, we should consider further investigation if we consider this patient high risk, if we remain concerned, and that CT scans are much, much more accurate. The second two papers are linked in theme because they're about communication of risk with patients and the potential benefits of certain treatments. This came from the same team in Australia. One of the papers was examining how best to communicate the risks versus benefits of CIRMS, selective estrogen receptor modulators, in women who were at high risk of breast cancer but who had never had breast cancer. And then the second paper was looking at the benefits and, and harms of aspirin to reduce colorectal cancer risk. Overall, one communication method called an expected frequency tree seemed to work best in terms of encouraging patients to engage with the intervention. And if you want to have a look at what they what they're like then just google expected frequency tree have a look in images and you'll see some fine examples there they are pretty neat it does make it very clear about the risk but what i thought was interesting was that there's all this debate around well how can we best convince patients to take some of these medications there seems to be such surprise that patients aren't that engaged with these drugs and I think we probably shouldn't be surprised so with the selective estrogen receptor modulators the actual absolute risk benefit is just about one percent 
So I suspect many patients will be thinking, well, there's only a one in a hundred chance that I'm actually going to benefit from this drug. And I really don't understand what these drugs are. And I prefer not to have any side effects. So why would I start them? What's interesting is that for the colorectal cancer risk prevention, m people were much more likely to be on board with the idea of taking a mini aspirin for a 10 year or more period. And I wonder if this is just because people feel that aspirin is a very, very non-threatening intervention, something that they might do in their normal life anyway, and so they're much more likely to buy into that idea. Now, on to the main event, and this is a paper that published in The Lancet this week, which I think will completely change how we manage primary prevention of cardiovascular disease in primary care. Even if this study alone is not enough to completely change our practice, it's going to lead to a whole raft of research. We're going to see loads more in this area over the next few years as a result of this. And, and I think that's welcome because it provides us with some answers to questions that we've all been asking for years. So the underlying premise to this study was that we still have a lot of uncertainty about the relevance of blood lipid concentrations in terms of the long-term incidence of cardiovascular disease and then moreover, whether there is any benefit of using lipid lowering therapies in people at a younger age who might have raised lipid levels. So this was a risk evaluation and risk modeling study. They collected almost 400,000 patients worth of data. I always wondered if researchers, when they are looking at these huge data sets, don't they just get a bit bored? But I guess maybe they're a special bunch of people. Anyway, they had 400,000 patients worth of data, half men, half women, a maximum follow-up of 44 years and almost 55,000 cardiovascular endpoints occurred. They then compared the population based around their non-HDL cholesterol levels at a younger age. They also then compared them against age, sex and other risk factors as well. And then they piled all of that into their risk model and looked at the potential benefits of a 50% reduction in someone's non-HDL cholesterol at a young age. There's a huge amount of data, which is actually pretty interesting, that came out of this study. But the simple conclusion was that a 50% reduction in non-HDL cholesterol concentration was associated with a reduced risk of cardiovascular disease by the age of 75 and that this risk reduction was greatest the earlier you started reducing someone's cholesterol. So they produced a number of risk tables for men and for women for the number of different risk factors that someone might have for cardiovascular disease, all compared against their starting HDL concentrations at a young age. And it gives the numbers needed to treat for each of these groups different, different risks. So they concluded that this is a simple tool for individual long-term risk assessment and the potential benefit of early lipid lowering intervention. So I'll give you a couple of examples. So their baseline was testing people's cholesterol under the age of 45. And of course, the outcome that they're looking for is cardiovascular events by the age of 75. So of course, by 75, there's a reasonable chance any of us might have had a cardiovascular event. But if you are a female under the age of 45 with a non-HDL cholesterol of less than 2.6 millimoles per litre, and you've got one or no risk factors for cardiovascular disease, the numbers needed to treat achieving that 50% reduction in non-HDL cholesterol, e.g. going on a decent statin, is 32. And if you've got two risk factors, so let's say you're a bit overweight and you're a your blood pressure is up a bit, the numbers need to treat is only 15. Those numbers need to treat are even lower for men. So in the same group under the age of 45 with a low and non-HDL cholesterol, then the numbers needed to treat if you've got two or more risk factors is just 10. And then you have a look at patients who have got a high cholesterol. So their non-HDL cholesterols would be say between 4.8 and 5.7. And in women, so even if you have no other risk factors, you've got a numbers needed to treat of just 11. And in men, the numbers needed to treat is only five. And that's even better, 3.6 if under the age of 45, you've got two risk factors for cardiovascular disease. 
So it is a little hard to assess truly how valid and accurate this study is. The risk model is very opaque. It's not something that we can test ourselves. And so I think it's fair to say that uh, it would be good to see these outcomes reconfirmed in further research. But it does seem very compelling. And I think this starts to provide some clarity around the issues of lifetime risk and how we can modify that in earlier life. I think the important messages from this paper are that in younger patients under the age of 45, 10-year cardiac risk tools are not that effective. They will ultimately lead to an underestimation of people's future longer-term lifetime cardiac risk. And by using this tool, we're effectively missing the boat on getting them early therapy that can have a substantial difference on their long-term outcomes. It suggests that those patients who come and see us with a cholesterol level of, let's say, around six, well, actually, maybe we need to not ignore that. And particularly if they've got any other type of risk factors, then it changes the discussion, perhaps towards favouring medication at an early age. So whether we do need more research or not, I think this is going to start a paradigm shift in how we think about cardiac risk management, particularly in those younger patients. And the way it's been reported in the media is that actually perhaps we should be checking people's cholesterols in their 20s, in their 30s. And then this group are the ones who might be starting on statins, not our patients in their 50s, not our patients in their 60s. And that perhaps we could not only prevent disease progression, but prevent disease development in the first place. It's a big thing to get our heads around. It's going to be an interesting one to see the public's reaction to this. It raises a whole host of questions about treatment burden, long-term effects of medication, medicalization of populations. But I think it's also a very interesting and exciting area. We're going to see a lot more from this in the not-too-distant future. And speaking of the future, we are on to our final section, future medicine. And this week, we're going to talk about an oral contraceptive that you might only need to take once a month. Before you get too excited, so far, this has only been tested in pigs. It is at the experimental stage, but it is crazy cool. So like something out of the matrix, you swallow the tablet, it starts degrading in the stomach that then allows six arms to open out from the capsule which then prevents the transmission of it down the down the gut so it gets stuck over the pyloric sphincter this then means that it can just sit there and slowly release levonorgestrel over the course of a month before it finally degrades and uh, gets absorbed completely does this affect what the pigs can eat they don't say. And luckily for the researchers, pigs can't tell them if their tummies feel a bit funny. So we're going to have to see how this pans out in human trials. Those are due to start in the next five years. This really is going to be targeted low to middle income countries where there's limited access to health care. So we may not be the target audience, but the concept of insect like capsules in our bodies is got to be something that they're going to run with in other areas too. watch this space. So that's it for the NB podcast in 2019. Thank you so much for joining us in our little experiment. I hope you've been enjoying this. We will be returning in the new year. So please do subscribe. Find us on Twitter at gphottopics.com. Please feel free to post your comments on Facebook. Um, if you find anything interesting out there in the medical literature, uh, looking at the future of medicine, then please do let me know. You can always email me at neil at nbmedical.com. That's N-E-A-L at nbmedical.com. And I, it just leaves me to wish you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. We will see you in 2020. Bye-bye.